I want to introduce our vision session speaker. Um, and a little housekeeping before I get into the introductions. Our vision session speaker is Twana Hodge, and um, she has asked that you introduce yourself in the chat uh, with uh, your name, uh, your pronouns, if you're comfortable with that, uh, any affiliation, organization, or role, and where you are joining us from. Uh, she will also have eight to nine questions that she'll pose throughout the sessions, um, uh, and um, they're going to be uh, posted in the chat as well. Um, and also, uh, she is planning to follow a pro progressive stacking facilitation technique. So if you identify as part of an underrepresented group, please prepend an asterisk uh, to your chat contributions so these contributions can be easily identified and addressed. And uh, with that, I will uh, do uh, the introduction for Tuana Hodge. Tuana Hodge, it, she, her, is the diversity, equity, and inclusion librarian at the University of Florida Libraries. She holds an MLIS from the University of Washington. Her research and professional interests include diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility issues and efforts in the workplace and LIS curriculum, library residencies and fellowships, cultural humility in librarianship, and the retention of underrepresented and BIPOC library staff in librarianship. She is the National Conference of African American Librarians 11 Conference Program Clan, Pan, excuse me, Conference Program Committee Co-Chair, the Association of College and Research Libraries 2021 Scholarship Committee Co-Chair, a member of the ACRL Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, the ACRL Residency Interest Group, Social Media and Communications Team Leader, and more. She is a 2013 Spectrum Scholar and a 2018 ALA Emerging Leader. And we are so excited to welcome you to NASIG Twana. Uh, thank you so much. I was just here blushing um, as, you were reading my, as you were reading my bio and I was like, oh, I should have cut that down. Um, but thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here uh, talking to you all here today. Um, I'm a little nervous and so usually when I'm nervous, I have a tendency to speed very quickly in the beginning. Um, but let me share my screen with you all and then let me put this into full screen. Um, and so I really and truly encourage you all to um, add things into the chat box because um, I don't want this to just be me talking at you all. Um, I really want to engage with you all over 200 and you know something of you all here in this room. And I see we do have people from a multitude of different places. Um, and so I am really, really um, excited and really honored to be thinking um, and ideating with you all about the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion in librarianship. And so with that, I am going to just very quickly. So I just wanna say um, to, for us to just take a moment and just breathe together. I'm not gonna tell you how to breathe or anything um, of that nature, um, but I know when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, that um, it can be a topic that people are like very familiar with and you know um, are radicals uh, and abolitionists in regards to, and some people that you know this is something that's new to them. And just being able to take a stock of your body and how you're feeling. And I definitely wanna credit Amanda Lefwich um, who is the founder of um, Mindful and um, Mindful in LAS um, with helping me to develop my um, breathing and reflective uh, reflective practice, which is very uh, key in the work um, that I that I do. Also, I want to take a moment of silence uh, to. Um, for the folks who have passed away due to COVID-19, as well as folks who have passed away uh, due to systemic um, inequalities, including systemic and uh, structural racism, as well as those who have passed away um, and due to state and country sanctioned violence. a little too quickly. Um, 
So just very quickly as I just kind of get my presenter view back up. That is great. Let me just put this here. All right. So we would like to, the University of Florida Libraries acknowledge that for thousands of years, the area now comprising the state of Florida has been and continues to be the home of many native nations. We further recognize that the main campus of the University of Florida is located in the heartland territory of two historically known native societies, the, those of the Potana and those of the Alachua Seminole. As part of our current stewardship, the UF Libraries acknowledges its obligation to honor ancestral present and future native residents of Florida, um, and also would like to acknowledge those who were forcibly taken um, and who were enslaved and now in what we now call the United States of America. Okay, so these are the various space agreements that I would like to um, enact uh, during our time here together. They were created by Mackenzie Mack, but inspired by Mickey Scott Bay Jones. And so I'm gonna read these aloud um, to you all. And so we agree to struggle against racism, sexism, transphobia, classism, sexism, ableism, ageism, rankism, and the way we internalize myths and misinformation about our own identities and the identities of other people. We know that no space can be completely safe. And we agree to work together towards harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in the room, even if it means centering ourselves. We agree to sit with the discomfort. Okay, it's going to be anywhere from uncomfortable, you know, discomfort, painful, um, awkward that comes with having conversations about race, gender, identity, the nonprofit industrial complex, etc. And we agree to try our best not to shame ourselves for the vulnerability that these kinds of conversations require. We agree to value the viewpoint of other people that do not challenge or conflict with our right to exist or challenge or conflict with another's rights to exist. And we, we agree that it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about boundaries, accountability, personal relationships, organizational relationship, justice, and care. And so if you do agree, please type in the chat box. If you have access to the chat box, I agree. So while we are here engaging in the space together that we agree to um, abide by these brave space um, agreements as we engage in this conversation here today. Thank you all. And so uh, the conversation guidelines, um, most people are familiar with this. Uh, the only thing that I will um, just kind of uh, touch on is the color brave space. Um, and that is in regards to um, similar to progressive stacking, but um, ensuring that this is a space particularly for BIPOC folks, black indigenous people of color to be able to speak up and engage um, in ways that they feel comfortable in engaging with this. Um, and this um, conversation guidelines that I got from Deborah Daniels, who's um, has been retired from the University of Washington, University of Utah. And so gonna reiterate um, that um, please to utilize um, an asterisk at the start of your question or a comment um, and that there is a Q and A um, function. And so we really do want you to direct your questions to the Q and A function. Um, we do have several people who are gonna be moderating the chat box, including myself, um, but we wanna make sure any questions that you have, we do capture them. Um, and able to respond to them when the Q&A question time comes up. Okay, so. Now, uh, there's this concept of Sankofa, uh, which is um, a Ghanaian concept. Um, and um, it's something where um, I have been uh, thinking more and more about, and that for the Net NCAL conference, that's uh, the theme um, as well. So it needs to go back and get it, uh, thinking about um, the past, thinking about how did we get where we are um, now, um, particularly looking at how are we, um, what is the past? Um, how did we get here? But also thinking about where we're going. And so this presentation has been split up into the past, the current, and thinking about what's next, what's the future. And so one of the things that I started off with is a land acknowledgement. So acknowledging this land and acknowledging the fact that uh, this country was not discovered, you know, uh, that there were um, indigenous communities um, here long before. 
And so really for us to think about how our history has been um, sanitized, has been censored, has been erased in many cases. And this is something that we're now, and for many folks have been um, trying to address for long periods of time. And the fact that um, a lot of what you all do has to do with information, you know, being able to uh, disseminate it to people, making sure people have access to it. And that is a huge responsibility. But part of that is understanding that for some communities, for some groups, um, that their information has been taken from them, has been stolen from them, has been oppressed, you know, uh, suppressed, um, that has been misconstrued, that, um, and that has meant a loss in many different ways, in many different cases. Even thinking about everything that happened in the last, this year and then the last year um, in particular and how everything came to a head um, just about a year ago in referencing to the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor um, and many others that we know and that we don't know. Um, and the fact that when we think about equity and inclusion and diversity, that these are not light words or terms that we're talking about. There, there's many people who are here um, in attendance who have uh, dealt with the impact of being um, erased, of dealing with psychological violence um, and emotional violence, having to deal with um, the pain of not being seen or engaging in hypervisibility as well as erasure simultaneously. So when we think about the past, thinking about how your own particular past and cultural background and history and how that is in integrated into the work that you are doing, thinking about the identities that you hold, the power and privileges that they have and how that bleeds through in your practices and how you engage with other people. And even thinking about how some of the things that we have created have um, reinforced the existing structures the structure of that, um, of patriarchy, you know, of whiteness and white supremacy culture, um, of, um, you know, able-bodied, and what does that mean? You know, thinking about class, you know, um, and social economic status, about nationality, um, about language. These are a lot of things that are, that are by design, um, and that whether we are conscious of it or not, that we are perpetuating in the kind of the work that we do. So part of the work of moving forward is looking back at our past and looking back at what are some of the things that we have not known. And it's not coming from it from a deficit perspective. Um, it's not saying, you know, I didn't know this. It's coming from a place, well, I didn't know this, but I want to learn more about gaining knowledge um, and about having a childlike curiosity you know, and but it's not treating people as walking psychopedias or treating people as though they're statistics and numbers that I need to have this many in order for this to um, be done. So think about your own past, your own individual past, but think about the past of your organization, of your unit, of your department. Think about your organizational culture. What would you, posing a question, um, to the audience, and it's not it's not on the list, but if anyone who's ever seen me engage before, um, I do love to um, pop up and you know um, pose questions. How would you describe your organizational culture to someone who's never been there, maybe someone who's new? How would you describe your organizational culture to them? And would diversity, equity, and inclusion be something that you even discuss? And so feel free to put that into the chat box. But let's think about a lot of these, how we think about um, our, um, how we proceed. So who is in your circles? Who are you comfortable with? Who do you regularly collaborate with? Who's your mentor or champion? Um, where do you get your content from? How do you embed this in your work practices and development? For me, I'm constantly engaging in a reflective practice, either individually or with groups of other people. I'm always looking at um, engaging in my own self-critique and thinking about what are some of the things that I'm missing? Who, who am I not engaging with? Which perspectives am I missing? Who's the most vulnerable group and population? And how can I engage with them further? How can I make sure that they are comfortable, that I'm putting their needs first, that I'm other? oriented, that I'm human-centered when I'm thinking about this work. 
And so as we're looking at the future, looking at our past, looking at uh, what we should we, we need to learn more about. And I know for me, this past year has been one where I've been um, elevated to a certain extent to educate a lot of people, which has been plus, uh, which has been really an amazing thing. Um, but also thinking about what are some of the things that we need to be doing? What is the power and privilege that we have and the identities that we do? And how does vocational awe impact the work that we do and the identities, the professional identities that we have. So why are we, are here, why are we here now? Uh, it's due to a number of different factors. Um, and I will post to you all this question and feel free to add to the chat box and make sure that I bring up the chat box so that I'm able to see people's responses. Um, why do you think we are here now? Due to structural um, isms and phobias, due to um, the past um, projects, plans, initiatives, all of this is by design. And all of this that we're doing is also things that we have to intentionally and strategically decide not to do anymore. So what are some contributing factors to why I'm here and we are here together now engaging in this topic. Fear of others, ethnocentrism, you pull out a really good um, point, Suzanne. How many times have we had the opportunity to engage in topics such as this and to, and to think and not to assume, not to engage in that automatic processing to think about these things, to know that what is, what is standard and normal is not the same for everyone, that everyone navigates this world a little differently. And it's, we all avoid things that is difficult and hard to deal with. That's just, that's a natural human response. But when you have people who's losing their lives and livelihoods because other people's comforts comes first, that's not how it should be. When we think about how folks are misrepresented or further triggered and traumatized just because of um, subject headings or the metadata that is utilized, that is, that is something that we, need to, that we need to think about and work to changing. When we think about the fact that Black Lives Matter, Native Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matter are politicized and that some place is very existence is political. When we think about the concepts of objectivity and neutrality and how at times we have utilized those concepts and weaponized them um, and said that these are things that we strive for, but understanding that when we say objectivity, that nothing is truly objective. The sheer creation of this field is not objective. The policies and procedures, collection development policies, how we, how we you know, deal with accusations is not objective. It's not neutral. So how could we be? We never were. We can learn to work and speak when we are afraid in the same way that we have learned to speak we learn to work and speak when we are tired by Audre Lorde. Really thinking about the fact that there's times we have been silent, that we have not intervened, we have not showed up, um, and that that adds to where we are now. That there are people who are witnessing, observing, who are um, counting, and who remembers what has been done and what hasn't been done. So when I think about this work, when I think about working with others, is really thinking about engaging even when that's the last thing that I wanna do and working to empower others to do this work.
and to support them where they are at. Not everyone is in the same place, but understanding if we don't do this collectively and individually when we can, then it will not get done. We're gonna have a multitude of movements and these movements are not moments. We're not focusing and we cannot focus on just moments, just one-offs. These are all interconnected. These are all tied together. They're not separate. As you probably heard the phrasing before, all, all of our, our liberation is tied together and it genuinely, it truly is. And so when we say we're stunned in solidarity, it is not a simple word, it is an action. It's a constant action. And as I've heard earlier this year, from someone who's a professor here at the University of, uh, University of Florida was doing a Black History Month program, that the uh, call for um, allies, applications for allies are closed, the call for allies are closed. We're looking for co-conspirators. You know, we're looking for radicals. We're looking for abolitionists. We're looking for liberators. Uh, we're looking for people who understand that it's them engaging, but also knowing when to stand out of the way. It's also for us to understand that it is being able to take on the burden and engage, even when we feel like we have a lot to lose. So think about, in response to everything that has happened and happening, <laughs> what has your institution have done? What is your unit, department, or you individually, what actions have you taken? What actions do you want people to take? Are statements enough? They're not. They're only the beginning, if there was even a statement about anything that has happened. And yes, as someone put in the chat box, that some of these things has been going on for generations, um, that people have been doing this work for decades. And sometimes just because I may know about something um, doesn't mean that it's new. It's been going on for a long, lot, lot longer than I have been. And there has been people um, who have sacrificed a lot in order to do the work that they are doing. So what would it take to transform our profession into, um, to where DEI is embedded into everything? It would, it it would take us conducting um, an audit of everything that we do, looking at our policies from recruitment and hiring to retention, to collection development, to um, even those who are in LAS programs, looking at how DEI is embedded into the program. There's currently no um, diversity requirement for um, LAS programs as far as I currently know. There's only one LAS accredited institution that's an HBCU, Historically Black College and University, and that's North Carolina Central University. I will pose this question to you all. How many people have had a class that talked about any aspects of diversity, equity, inclusion in the K through 12 education, but for those who've gotten uh, an MLIS degree or um, a library school degree. How many of our professional organizations have consistently included DEI in the content? It's not that it started five years ago or 10 years ago. If you were to do um, an audit of the NASIG um, presentation, conference presentations, would you be able to trace back to when NYSIC first started that there was a DEI presentation, a part of it, or a track, or involvement? So what would it take? It would take us seriously critiquing and reflecting ours on ourselves first. And so as we consider what would it would take?
And so as we're looking at this, just chiming into the chat box, chat box right now. Um, and so was there even a class that talked about your racial identity and the impact that that has in programs and services? At my program, we didn't. There were some courses, that, sorry, there was some content, um, there were some um, classes, but to say definitively, yes. Throughout our whole professions, throughout our professional organizations and associations, we have had a historic and current record of incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion into everything that we think of it, that it's not an option, it's not a luxury, it's not a tack on. It's not something that we only do um, if we have a person of color um, or underrepresented group. What resources and, and efforts are required? Budget. As people have said, you can tell where people are invested in is where their budgets, is their budgets, where the money goes. So how much money do you invest in this? How many people are invested in this work? Is it one, is it a handful who are focused and concentrated on this? Are there people who are qualified and can ask the challenging questions and engage and facilitate, facilitate um, people's growth within these areas? Do people feel empowered to push back and question their supervisors, their colleagues, their administration, their leadership? Is it one off or every for you often? Is it just regaled to just taking compliance uh, trainings and that is it? If somebody brings up something that's irrehensible or questionable or racist or sexist or homophobic, what happens? Nothing? Something? Or is it ignored and dismissed? The resources that are required is immense at times, but at that is the time and, and budget and money. Those are the things that are, that are most needed. Because to do this work, because if you were to build an assessment program, if you were to build an, um, an OER program, um, you will need the people who are qualified. You will need a budget. So why is it any different for DEI? What needs to be discarded? A lot. Uh, in particular, I think we need to understand more about, um, someone brought up our biases, but also the isms and phobias that exist and not being um, afraid to call them like we call a collection. There's some things that's obsolete. There's some things that does more harm than good. And that's language that I can think of. Our languages, what we use, how we describe people, the words that we use, the questions that we ask, where are you from? Why do we ask that question? Where are you really from? Where are your parents really from? When we think about these things as how we engage with others and how we gather information and information that's shared, power comes into play and power is always at play, whether we're conscious of it or not. So thinking about what needs to be discarded, what needs to be changed, how we do things, how we operate, how we think. And, we, and this has already been happening. Continuing education is a part of librarianship. It's a part of GLAM, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So we need to be more cognizant of what needs to be changed. And it's how we approach things and how we consider it is things as normal and standardized. And how do we define success? Success for me is being able to not have to look hard to see things that adequately reflect who I am or where I am from. 
it is not being the only one or one of you. It's not feeling that my right to exist is always in question and always seen as up for debate. So how, how would you define success? All of us feeling represented, that you feel like you belong, that you have human dignity and respect, that who you are is not tied to identities that you cannot change. How do we hold ourselves accountable? For me, is what I do at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month. Am I making sure that I'm easing people's uh, suffering or the harm that they are dealing with? Do people feel more comfortable engaging with others that are different from them? You know? Have I dedicated enough time to learning about this community's perspective, to learning about my own history and the histories of others? I have people who I check in with on a regular to make sure that um, I am doing what I set out to do, that the goals that I have set are being accomplished. But it's also bringing in other people to do that as well. I've, I have, I spend 40 hours a week more focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some people do not have that. But how are we making sure that we are in alignment with our mission, mission, vision, strategic um, goals, directions, code of ethics? Are we able to provide unbiased, equitable responses to requests? Are people who, um, are people just able to engage with the materials the way that they, base feel, they best feel comfortable? How do we feel forward? If you didn't know this, sorry to have to tell you this, uh, but we all will fail, sometimes horrifically, sometimes publicly, uh, many, many times we will fail. We will say the wrong things. We will do the wrong things. We will freeze up in the moments that we shouldn't have freezed up. We will overthink and rethink things. Um, and our anxiety might stop us from interjecting. But it's to learn from those moments. It's to understand that this call, this work, it is never ending, it is never ending. So we have to make sure that we are committed and we're willing to sacrifice. And not to say that sacrifice is bloody, is that it's a lot. Sometimes it means we don't say things, we think twice about before we say something. And sometimes we don't think twice, sometimes we say it, because sometimes it needs to be said that way it means thinking about the identities you have and the power that they have. Am I a supervisor? Am I a manager? Am I a dean? Do I have the most power in this room? And if I do, how do I negate it? How do I empower others? So when I say fail forward, I really mean that because that is what we need. So the future. So thinking about and going back a little bit and tying it into everything. So you all have might seen this several times. Um, I have a habit of any rooms that I'm in dropping this in if it's if it's particularly relevant. Um, and just thinking about how um, the right supremacy characteristics, how some of these things manifest themselves. Um, I remember when I first came across these two documents um, that I was like, oh, I do engage in a lot of this. Um, you know, and these are things that I have to be cognizant of and shift away from. And there are anecdotes in um, 
my slide will be shared. Um, and with that will be my resources. Um, but in these resources, they do have anecdotes. But thinking about how many of these do you all see manifested, um, even in yourself or others? The sense of urgency, we need to get this done right this second. Fear of open conflict. Power hoarding. How many times have we seen that happen? Quantity over quality, we must do everything, all of it. And we must be perfect at it. Defensiveness. How many times have people clammed up, gotten defensive? They listened to respond, not listen to hear and process. So I pose this to you all. How many of these characteristics have you seen occur in your organizations? All, some? I highly doubt it's none. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to be able to see this and say, huh, this is a lot. And this might be your organization now, your previous organization. And the, fa the fact, and this is, this is only a selection of the few. There's more <laughs> that I couldn't put on this slide. And so I definitely encourage you all to go through, go through these and think about how do these um, show up in your organizational culture? I mean, how you interact and do things and how you process things and navigate the world, you know, either or thinking. The right to comfort, that those in power um, their comfort comes ab above others and, and that they have uh, the privilege and the preference of being comforted first and only, you know. And so for us to think about as we want to change into the future, to have this future where DEI is um, embedded into everything, is thinking about what the culture is right now and what is preventing DEI from taking hold. Because we've been talking about DEI or diversity and multiculturalism for decades. We've gone from affirmative action um, and, and people saying you're affirmative action higher to diversity higher, you know. But what are the what what are what are the reasons why we have only shifted five percent, two percent, one percent? In order for us to move towards the future we want, we have to change right now and continue to change and make a pledge to continue to change and hold ourselves accountable. The future holds folks being able to engage in the way that they wanna engage. Regardless, take away the table analogy because that still has, somebody still has to invite you to the table. Um, and even if you're at the table, you may not have a seat. You may not be able to speak or if you're speaking, somebody's speaking over you, or someone is taking your ideas um, and representing them um, as theirs. So what does the future hold in regards to the AI? It is bountiful, it is plentiful, but it is where equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging, excuse me, are at the forefront. That is what the future holds. We are all responsible. Everyone in this room and who's not is responsible. This is all on us, whether we're cognizant of it or not. We will never be done. I mean, it sounds terrifying to say, I feel like we will be done when the, the existing power structures are no more, where people are able to show up and, ex and, and engage in ways that they feel comfortable and know that they're not going to be, there's no fear of retribution or retaliation um, or that people are going to um, um, see them as being different and different is bad. Um, and that difference means that you are not wanted. That being able to know that I'm not presumed incompetent because of the fact that I am black and a woman. That I'm, that I'm not in, presumed incompetent because of my, my age, because of factors that I have no control over.
So where are we going? I'm trying to create a world that doesn't exist right now. For me, it would be almost complete opposite of where we are now. And that is a world where I never have to think twice about driving through the South and that I have to rearrange my whole schedule so that I'm not driving through sundown towns, that I'm not terrified, you know? It's where that I can go into any library and know that that will find books on how to do black here, you know? That I will be able to look up into, you know, access any library catalog and I don't find terms that would re-traumatize me or others. More of this, more and more of this to the point that you cannot even think, navigate, dream <laughs> without thinking about this, that it is seeped into everything and that you feel emboldened and, 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 and strong and that you have the knowledge, capabilities and, and strength to be able to do this and engage in it. And you're comfortable with being uncomfortable. That is what I want for you. So getting towards belonging, getting towards belonging. And right now I can say with 110% certainty that everyone that's here and anyone that's gonna be listening to this, that they do not feel like they belong in their job, in their institution, in this profession, 100%. So what do we need to do to change that? And will you continue and start to do what is necessary? And what is necessary is gonna look different for everyone. Some people are, are, are marching in the streets. Some people are calling and writing to persons in government. Um, some people are writing and researching this. Some people are working on ways to utilize their powers in many different ways. So are you willing to do what is necessary? Because if not, then you just need to get out of the way so other people can do what is necessary. So where do we go from here? I think we go back, we reassess, we conduct that audit, we review this through a critical race theory lens, many different lenses and theories. We do this work so that who coming after us, the products that we produce, that people are not being harmed intentionally or unintentionally. And if we can't see a problem, we can't fix a problem. From Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. These are my these are resources, upcoming webinars, and questions. I don't know how many times we have a question. I'm hoping that I didn't go over too long, um, but I'm looking forward to the questions that you all have for me. And please feel free to ask me really challenging questions. Um, and you can contact me on Twitter. Uh, you can contact me via my email listed here. Um, and I continue, I love to engage in conversations like these. All right, so um, I'm going to go from the bottom up just because there's, there's been a lot of chatter. And so someone asked, do you think trainings work? Um, there is, there is um, some studies done and I've attended some webinars about people who've talked about why diversity trainings don't work. For me, it's thinking about um, re-education because we've all been miseducated. So for me, it's more kinging it from a training because you can't take one training and be like, boom, I am culturally competent um, in the ways of um, working with 
uh, the Seminole communities um, and I understand all of their traditions, norms, and practices. That's not how it works. Um, so for me, is looking at it in terms of education. So what are we consistently um, going to be learning about and being able to integrate what we learned into what it is that we're doing? Because one 60-minute um, training or 30-minute training is not going to educate, educate you through all of the contextual um, and historical uh, things that has happened. Burnout. Oh, gosh. Okay. So that is a really good question in terms of experiencing burnout. So, um, and that's something that is that that has occurred and that will occur if there is not mechanism put into place to prevent that from happening. So burnout occur for a lot of different reasons, lack of autonomy, um, the workload, um, other different factors. So before you approach burnout, uh, making sure that uh, there's some self-preservation practices, and I attribute this completely to Katrina, who does a lot of work um, on de-authentication um, and low morale, um, but engaging in self-preservation practices before that gets to that point. Um, but it is a lot. It is a lot. Thinking about what is happening um, across the world, even thinking about what's happening in our own backyard, but it's also it's happening people and understanding that this is not something that an, an individual has to take on. It's understanding that in order to do this work, we have to make sure that we are right and we are settled ourselves. So like people say, like putting on your own mask first before you help others. Um, and that engaging in this work doesn't have to be this huge, you know, um, thing. Sometimes it's the smallest thing, the low hanging fruit um, that, that can consistently be done. But I'm also a fan of tapping other people in and pulling other people in to be able to work alongside them to do this work. I mean, fatigue will happen, burnout will happen but it is making sure that um, there's ways to recover from it and to prevent it from occurring frequently. And if I've missed any questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. Uh, once again, and you could also send them to me or the panelists um, individually if you do want, if you do not want to send your questions to uh, the audience um, as well. And you can also um, So someone asked, do you, I have any recommendations for addressing systemic institutional issues when you're experiencing burnout as the sole person of color constantly having to speak up and do EDI, the EDI work? So um, Finding your, uh, finding your champions, your sponsors, your core conspirators in your organization. If there's not any in your organization, finding other people outside of your organization that's willing to speak up on your behalf, you know? Um, and so for me, that has been something that um, I have, um, I have done here in terms of being able to have folks who have been uh, working on engaging with this. And um, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do was to last year to hold a series on like looking at institutional racism and different factors from like librarianship, University of Florida, University of Florida libraries um, overall. Um, and being able to take that time off. If someone says that um, I'm a huge fan of the NAP ministry, uh, they are um, on social media, uh, particularly in Twitter, and it's taking breaks. That rest is resistance. That for some folks, just taking a breath, just breathing is resistance. That we do not have to be do going at it 110%, 200% all of the time. Racial battle fatigue occurs. So we have to make sure that if there's a person of color that is doing this work and it's the only one, that you're taking care of yourself first because there will all be other people to do that work. That work will get done, even if it's not to the extent that you want it to get done. 
How can we respond to our institutions who continue to ask staff, especially BIPOC staff, to do diversity work without compensating us for the extra work? Please don't. So I will, <laughs> you're, you're adding to um, and you're harming the folks. So for me, um, when you're asking the one of, of, of the only one of one of you, particularly staff, and especially if there's like a faculty staff uh, kind of situation that's going on um, to do this work, first, you're assuming that one, that all by crap folks automatically know how to engage in this work. Um, sorry to cut it to you, not everyone does. Um, just because you are a person of color doesn't automatically means that you can be the, the DEI person for a whole organization um, and being able to support people in addition to doing like two other jobs. Uh, second of all, it's saying that anyone can do this, um, can do this work um, and that uh, this work is uh, simple and easy. We can just task this person to do this work and it will get done. Um, but then it also sets them up to be script goats when it is not done well or people haven't changed. So it has something to do with the staff or how they do something. And it's very easy to say that they, they are at fault for this. Um, the fact that if you're not compensating them, um, then that's just, that you're just I'm trying to say this professionally. You're kind of insulting them essentially um, and, the, and the labor. And so for people who are doing this work and they're not uh, fairly compensated, uh, whether they have service obligations taken off, um, it could be paid. Could, there's a number of different ways compensation can be um, provided, um, especially if it is extra work. If that person has not been hired and DEI is not in their title, that is extra work and you need to hire an external consultant to do this work. Um, Let's see, how do I feel about using white advantage instead of white privilege to help white staff who have trouble understanding that they still have privilege, privilege despite perhaps their hard upbringing? This was recently suggested in my institution as a change in terminology. Um, as I was uh, attending a presentation on um, just this Monday, it was the Lyricist Summit, and I believe it's Pamela Newkirk. Um, who wrote this book, uh, Diversity Inc., a billion dollar um, business, who were talking about um, essentially this, uh, when somebody had asked a question about like the attack on critical race theory that has been um, ongoing. Um, whatever is needed to help educate people so that they can learn, you know? So for people to understand, it's not that you didn't have it hard, it's, it's that other people have it harder is that you did not have to think about if you had to wear a mask that people might um, automatically see you as a criminal or more of a criminal, you know? And so if white advantage is going to help people understand these concepts and help them grow, then that's fine. But the thing is, is that uh, they get to a point that people also have to engage in this work and you cannot, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't wanna say, <laughs> Well, being able to engage in this work um, and um, doing what is necessary to get people on board, but I'm saying that it gets to a point where people have to uh, take it upon themselves and learn um, and learn more. And you can't get any more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a uh, generic or uh, make it any more palatable. Because some things are just, it is what it is. You cannot make it palatable. You cannot um, make it more um smaller than what it actually is. And I will just reiterate, feel free to put your questions into the Q and answer uh, box. I'm also going back to the chat to see if there was any, anything um, that came out. What would you, what, would you happen to have any ideas of, about why some may leave the profession that are associated with DEI issues? There's actually a whole series that the Association of Southeastern Regional Libraries um, have done um, on why did I leave the profession, DEI perspectives. And they have done two. There's one more that's coming up in about a month. Um, and um, people have left because they've been traumatized. Um, they've left because people have said, we want diversity. We want racial and ethnic diversity. But when people came and when people worked, they really didn't want it. They wanted the numbers, but not the people. They wanted to be able to say, 
look, we have one or two or a few, but not willing to move them up to give them power to support them in the work that they're doing. And there's a multitude of initiatives to recruit. There's the ALA Spectrum Program, the ERL Has Kaleidoscope, it's a number of different things, you know, and even, um, you know, there's different like fellowships and grants that's out there, but what it's moved, what, maybe 1%, one and a half percent since these programs gotten started. So people are leaving the profession and they're leaving for good reasons. Why would you stay in a profession that is dysfunctional, abusive and neglective to you or an institution? In an attempt to deal with institution and systemic isms, I struggle with when to publicly call out my institution and its leadership. On one hand, I wish to give the institution leadership a chance to address the issues without the need to potentially publicly embarrass them. On the other hand, it seems universally the case that the institution's leadership um, do not seriously address issues unless this, this is a public calling out um, advice. So a lot of the times, one of the things I have to do is figure out like what motivates people to do this work? What are their motivating factors? Is it um, their rank and status? Um, is it being able to uh, be the only one to see that they have this, to be highlighted? Um, is, it, is, it, is it money? Um, figuring out what is their, what is their core motivation? Um, if they don't wanna be humiliated, if that's, the, if that's their motivation, um, you know, also thinking about yourself um, and, 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 and all of that. Um, but thinking about if that is their core motivation, their motivation is, is to avoid embarrassment and humiliation, or they want to make sure that they seem pristine or they're doing um, all the necessary things. Then um, considering, is there someone else who can call them out on your behalf? You know, is there other ways that you can, um, with documentation, um, allay your concerns, uh, continue to allay your concerns um, to them. Um, are there other ways that maybe you can um, bring in, go above their heads to the next level to say like, hey, you know, we, I have done these things. Um, more my group and I have done these things. These are some concerns and we feel like they're not adequately being, um, being addressed. We have seen a number of what not to do. And so if they wanna be, avoid being what not to do, um, and that's one of the ways that they're gonna act right and do what's right, um, then sometimes you have to do that. But really thinking about the pros and the cons of what that would constitute um, and mean. How do you effectively respond with the question of the EI is greeted with response? Well, there are all kinds of diversity other than race, sexual orientation. Why can't we all focus on all of those other things too? Not. Okay, no, I totally, I only totally understand. It's like when people, when someone says Black Lives Matter and they're like, all lives matter. And it's like, um, mm, yes. Um, and as someone have said, it's not like you want to go to um, a breast cancer awareness event and say like colon cancer um, matters too. It's like each thing has its own focus. Okay, so for me, in order to be inclusive, we have to be exclusive. We have to say, we're going to focus on race and ethnicity right now. Uh, we're gonna focus on sexual orientation. We're gonna focus on um, social economic status. We're gonna focus on these factors, but also acknowledging that intersectionality exists. I don't just show up as black in any space that I am in. You know, I have a multitude of identities, visible and invisible, that impacts how I, am, how I navigate the world and how people engage with me. And so when people say there's all types of diversity, I will be like, well, uh, no, we can't focus on this right now because we need to focus on racial and ethnic um, diversity. We've seen the impact of not focusing on it and how it led to where we are right now. Um, so if you feel like leaving, you've done enough. Okay, and we, we are so grateful and so thank you for your service, but you do not need to stick around if this is, if you want to leave, you know? And there's a multitude, like for me, I'm like, I will always be a librarian, even if I'm like, 
retired, <laughs> you know, um, even if I voluntarily leave. And so if, the, if leaving is in your best interest, do what it is, what is necessary for you to be successful and for you to um, have a, a life that um, puts you first. Because sometimes librarianship does not put people of color, folks from underrepresented groups and identities first. So you have to put you first. Uh, how do you balance holding people accountable and upholding your library's policies with compassion? Do I often feel that compassion is synonymous with fostering um, entitlement? Hmm. This is a really good question. I have not thought about it in this way. Um, for me, in terms of thinking about my library's policies, some of these policies cannot be uh, <laughs> with compassion. When you think about some of these policies and when they were created and who they were created to keep in and out. Um, and so first of all, it would be like looking at those policies um, essentially and, and redoing them. But in terms of holding people accountable, people have to hold their own selves accountable. You can um, support them in that endeavor. Uh, but in the end, it's up to in the end, it's up to them and what it would mean um, for them to continue to do this work. Um, it's hard when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, who wouldn't want to have a more inclusive place where um, you are able to come and do your work and not feel like somebody is going to say that your hair is too un is unprofessional or your food is too smelly or that you know um, English we should only do this in English and English only you know um, or this needs to be done right now and regardless to the fact that it will not be done well and so when we think about um, for me I, I'm more compassionate with the folks who are most affected. Um, and who are most vulnerable. And I don't see it essentially as fostering entitlement and I'm hoping that I'm answering your question. So when DEI training is provided, my institution tends to focus on individual solutions, understanding personal bias, recognizing unconscious bias and the like. How can we help institutions move beyond training on individual solutions to focusing on systemic problems? Discussing how the institution is racist or how the institution is hold, upholding white supremacy, um, discussing how the profession is racist and upholding white supremacy. I have broached this topic with my administration, administration with success so far. So if there's anyone in the room who are able to um, assist this person, um, and if there's any tactics that have worked for them, feel free to put your institution, um, uh, feel free to put in your contact information so they can contact you. And that's part of the reason um, is identifying folks who have struggled with this and who have been successful um, with this work. So in terms of moving to um, beyond training on focusing on systemic problems, um, kind of goes back to response is kind of figuring out what would, what would, what is their motivating factors and what would move them to begin to address this? Um, for administration, is it because um, they don't know um, they feel that this is an era that they don't have any um, knowledge or power in? Is it that the, the fact that they are terrified of, of failing and failing spectacularly? Um, I think it is trying to engage and figure out what, what, what are they more afraid of? But then also thinking about um, how would this be, how was this in alignment? to their mission, vision, and values. Maybe they have peer institutions um, that they are uh, in competition with. Maybe um, there are organizations um, or associations who have been doing this work and they can say, look, look at what they are doing and they are successful. This is the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Like we are beyond to be like, you know what? You all have done a great job educating us and getting to this level. So now we need to go at a 202 level and be able to think about like, how are we, how is this embedded? And what are some of the things that we can do to dismantle this, you know? And so if you haven't had success with that aspect, um, gathering a group of people inside and outside of the institutions and then redoing it. Suggestions on what to do when the final decision great influence rests on one person higher up that refused to budge in certain DEI initiatives. 
Oh, that is a heavy question. Um, and one is if it's just one person or higher ups, whether it's like the, the dean or the rector or the CEO or the president, um, refuse to budget certain DEI initiatives, asking why, what is some of the feedback um, in terms of why, why, asking people, why do you feel this way? What is, why did you respond, you know, this way? Not, not, not to get their defensiveness up, but to see like, is there a way that you need to re maybe redo your proposal um, or how you're asking for this? Are there maybe other aspects that um, might be missing um, that needs to be incorporated? Um, but I think it's just asking for them, okay, you know, we asked for these things or um, you've made your decision. Um, is it, can we get uh, your rationale? Um, your, your rationale for this, um, especially if this is something uh, that, well, not especially, um, in particular, the, if this is something that a lot of people have been pushing for, working on, um, and um, documenting, document, 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 you know, um, and um, anything that you all do, when they respond, when they didn't respond, how they responded, um, and then if necessary, getting other people who are in alignment, you know, champions and sponsors um, in your organization, outside of your organization to help you retool it um, or to ask them to be like, hey, you know, um, to, to go and ask them on your, on your behalf. Yeah. Um, yeah, when it comes to recruitment, uh, that's a, yes, totally, totally see that. Let's see if there's any more questions that I might have missed from folks. Um, It looks like we have gathered, I've answered and <laughs> gathered, answered um, a lot of the questions that you all um, have had. Um, but I really want to say that like, we don't have the option to opt out um, anymore, uh, that a lot of this work um, is sometimes not as hard as we think it is. It's not as laborious, it's not as scary. Sometimes it is, depends on what it is, uh, but the future depends on us first and foremost, and the people who are here and the people who are not here, you know. Um, and so as someone says, is to work on the people who are threes, who are on that fence, who can be convinced, and maybe the twos. Um, but this is work that we have to be committed to, continually committed to. Um, Let's see, there's no more questions that have popped up. So I will challenge you all to transform, not to conform. And that we are striving towards having a place where people can thrive and not just survive. It is connecting with people, centering their humanity, being compassionate, caring. These are all necessary. What are your thoughts on what is an appropriate scope for university DEI trainings? One mandatory training ask staff to commit to activities and changes in their lives outside of work. Several folks were irritated by this. Others thought it was absolutely necessary. Um, mm, this is a really good question. My initial response and thought to reading um, this is that we are not separate. So when we come to work, when we show up to work, turn on the computer, we walk into the doors of our buildings, um, we are, we do not, our identities and our backgrounds and our histories does not automatically melt away and we become like a melting pot one people. Um, that libraries does not, um, 
that we do not operate outside of society. And so there's a lot of things that impact us um, and the work that we do. So in regards to thinking about activities outside of, um, outside of their work, there are some people who have no people of color in their intimate personal spaces uh, whatsoever. Some people are completely fine with that. Uh, some people are, you know, uh, may, may, may not be and, you know, may want to change that. But really thinking about how our personal lives impact our professional lives and the comfort level we have and engagement we do in our personal lives that impacts our um, professional life. And so for some people, they may see it as um, infringing on their personal on their personal life outside of work. But I would challenge to say what aspect of what it is that we do that our personal lives does not impact the work that we do. So when we think about appropriate, appropriate is subjective. And it depends on, you know, even within DEI training, what specifically are they asking people to do? Are they asking people to um, watch the, Netflix documentary 13th um, and think about how people had to be amended and added <laughs> to the constitution. Um, like, you know, really thinking about some of these things. So for me, some of them are appropriate. Thank you all. Um, you all give me the inspiration to do this. And to be completely honest, and I don't mind this being on record, that I was very nervous um, preparing for this presentation and even as I was giving it, because, you know, as much as I uh, do this work, um, you know, thinking about the future, the future is numberless and it's always changing, um, but it's the decisions that we make that influence the work that we do, you know, um, and that we're all in this together. You know, we're all in this together. Um, and I just want to say shout out to the folks from the Caribbean, born and raised in the island of St. Thomas. Um, and so Caribbean folks have a very, very special place in my heart. Um, and acknowledging that um, where I was born and raised does influence how I see and approach the work that I do. Um, and living on the mainland has been a very informative experience in how I approach this work as well. So um, I'm happy to get you all thinking about the future uh, and that the future starts right now. We do have about four more minutes if there are any more questions, but if not, um, I'll go ahead and, hold on, I'm bringing up my, there we go. Uh, thank you so much for attending our first vision session um, and our first session for NASIG 2021. And thank you so much, Tuana. I, I'm personally thinking really hard about all, all sorts of new ideas and new ways of thinking. And I'm just so, so glad that, that I'm going to have that to chew on um, in the next few days and weeks and things. Um, and so thank you so much for your work, Tuana. Um, the recording of uh, this vision session will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks. And you can check the conference Discord server for any continuing conversations on this and many other topics uh, through the end of the month. And please join us again um, after the break for our next session. Um, thank you, Betsy, uh, Megan, the people who uh, selected me to present. Um, I absolutely love engaging in this work and being able to share it with others um, is truly amazing. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging with you all um, online um, at other conferences, hopefully in person um, once again, um, <laughs> hopefully in the, in the short term, in the short term future. But I think I wanna leave you with is uh, taking the lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 from this pandemic um, from understanding um, from people who have unnecessarily lost their lives and understanding that um, if we don't do this work, 
the um, people's lives and livelihoods will continue to be foregone and lost. Um, and so that that is what we're trying to fight against. And that's the future that we want to have is that people are able to succeed, not in spite of, but because their success um, has been centered um, and has been cultivated and has been focused on. So enjoy the rest of NASIG. Um, unfortunately, I cannot participate because I have other things to do, but knowing that my spirit is here with you all um, and encouraging you all throughout the rest of this conference.